Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're talking about obedience, and we've discussed lots of important points about obedience, but this time we'll be addressing a related subject. There are people in our lives who we should obey. Does that mean that we need to worry about preserving their good name? Do we need to make sure that we don't harm their reputation? Now, in a certain sense, we should never be out to harm anyone's reputation, unless there's an objective and valid reason for doing so. But we covered all that in episode 131, under Detraction, and I won't go over it again here. The question, therefore, is going to be, if you have a valid, objective reason for harming or allowing harm to come to the reputation of an authority figure, is it still all right to do so? What if they're higher-ups in the church itself? What if they're the Pope, even? I would say that the answer to all of these questions is yes. There is nothing immoral about damaging the reputation of a person if you have a valid, objective reason to do so, regardless of who that person is or what kind of authority they have. Still, others have raised objections to this, so I'm going to take a moment to go over some of them. Objection 1. Any failure to support an authority figure over you is detraction, so we should always support those in authority over us, especially in the church, in order to avoid giving scandal. At the very least, we should never say anything bad about them. To start with, the statement at the beginning of the first sentence is false. Detraction is only detraction when you have no valid, objective reasons for revealing the information. However, there's something else that this objection seems to be forgetting. Namely, if you do have a valid, objective reason for revealing the truth, it's entirely possible that refusing to reveal it would cause even more scandal than doing so, especially in cases where a leader is actually teaching people to do evil. Pointing that out can be a very helpful and important thing to do, especially with regard to church affairs. Many people mistakenly view church leaders as role models, and while some are, it's hardly the norm. The sooner people become aware of this, the less likely they are to be led astray. And what is scandal if not that? Objection 2. While it's true that certain saints have even gone so far as to criticize the Pope openly for his conduct, the reason it was okay for them to do so was that they were extremely holy. Some even scourged themselves as punishment for relatively minor sins. Unless we can match up to that level of holiness, we're not allowed to criticize the Pope, and possibly not even others in positions of ecclesial authority, for their disobedience. I find this objection puzzling because it doesn't offer any standard for exactly how much holiness is needed to reach this alleged plateau, how you determine whether you had that level of holiness, or why the difference between a right and wrong action would be so dependent on it anyway. The fact is, we have no means of measuring our own holiness or the holiness of others, and it's not our job to. That's God's business. Even the holiest saints, while they were here on earth, rarely seem to consider themselves holy. As far as scourging oneself goes, it seems like a pretty heavy price to pay for something as basic as the right to speak the truth for a valid, objective reason. Still, there are those of us who would go to those extremes if we felt there were some reason to do so. However, this idea is, as it turns out, completely absent from the writings of the saints. They come down on detraction and disobedience to proper authority, often even more forcefully than I just did. But with regard to who's allowed to criticize the Pope or other ecclesial authorities, they don't tend to offer any criteria like this. Objection 3. The Pope is different from all other authority figures, and no ill should ever be spoken of him in public, because doing so would harm the faith of those who don't fully understand the parameters of his infallibility, only when he speaks from the chair on matters of faith and morals. Such people see the Pope as the voice of the Church itself, and would view any apparent weakness in the Pope's character or actions as grounds for doubting that he was appointed by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we need to walk on eggshells when it comes to the Pope. Nobody will leave the church because of something a bishop says, but the Pope isn't the same in that regard. I'm going to address that last sentence first, because I think it's the most clearly false of the bunch. Yes, people have left the church because of something said by a bishop. People have left the church because of something said by a parish priest. People have left the church because of something they were told by a member of the laity, or even by people who didn't even belong to the church. People leave the church for lots of reasons. 
Now, as to the main point of the objection, anyone who sees the Pope as the voice of the Church itself is mistaking him for Jesus and holds a false belief, which is not part of being Catholic. Indeed, such people are likely to leave the Church sooner or later anyway if they don't abandon that false belief. Therefore, we have the responsibility to explain the truth to them about how things stand and where their belief primarily should rest. If it rests on the person of the Pope, their faith will be shattered by the next Pope Liberius who comes along, and they might even leave the church bitter and angry that no one warned them sooner. Those kinds of people are a nightmare to try to win back. Your best bet is not to lie to people by pretending the Pope is a better man than he is, but just explain to them how things stand and who we really worship. It's not the Pope. Case closed. Objection 4. If you're going to criticize an authority figure, you can do so by just writing them a letter personally, especially when they're a public figure with an image to keep up. The problem with this is that authority figures with images to keep up often have very large and public audiences as well, people who listen to them and go along with what they say. A private message to a public figure will often be ignored, and then the many people who follow him in his evil doing will continue to follow him in his evil doing, and nothing will have been accomplished. This is another thing that's meant by a valid, objective reason. If a public figure is drawing people into evil by their public works and actions, a private message isn't going to fix the problem. Sometimes the only way to solve the issue is to reach the public in your own way and let them know publicly that they should take what this figure says with a grain of salt for their own sake. Objection 5. Many good and even holy people have decided not to openly criticize those in authority over them. Therefore, it must not be right to do so. <sighs> Another puzzling one. I don't criticize individual people in these videos, but it's not because I think it would be wrong to do so. It's because these videos, by and large, are about the truth, and anything I say about any celebrity or politician or bishop, or even about a pope, while it might be true today, could be false in 10 or 20 years, and will almost definitely be false in 80 or 90. I just don't see it as on topic to point out specific people like that. They know who they are. In the same way that I have good reasons for not addressing this subject, but don't think that it's wrong to do so, so it's entirely possible that the good and holy people to whom the objector refers might have their own reasons for not offering criticisms, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they think it's wrong to criticize authority figures. Furthermore, even if they did think it was wrong to do so, they wouldn't necessarily be right about that. As St. Thomas Aquinas, perhaps the greatest theologian in the history of the Catholic Church, once said, Subjects have an example of zeal and freedom, that they fear not to correct their prelates, particularly if their crime is public and verges upon danger to the multitude. Because the truth must never be set aside through fear of scandal. St. Thomas Aquinas, in a commentary on Galatians 2, 11-14. Next time, what's the purpose of prayer? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.